Hey, it's Paul McFadden here and I'm joined with Taylor McDonald, which I'm really looking forward to having a conversation with because his journey in property has been off the charts and I'm excited to share that with you. And that's the whole purpose of this podcast is to get you to be inspired by other people's journey because for most people, when you start to learn about their background and their own journey themselves, the good, the bad, the ugly and everything they've had to go through to get to where they are today, but more importantly, where they're going it's incredibly inspiring and Taylor's story is one of those ones that will really get you thinking about what is truly possible. So first and foremost, welcome Taylor, how are you? Cheers Paul, I'm good thanks, good, yourself? Yeah, good man, good. So you you made the, the travel down, yeah? Yeah, always, I'm getting pretty used to it now to be fair, I'm here as often. Good stuff. I'm looking forward to getting into this here as well, but as always when I, I start off these, these podcasts, I like to take them back to pre property now i know that you were involved in some property in terms of a few buy to lets before you came along mm -hmm. to to work with us but take us back to you know the the tail in the early days and then um, kind of venture into being in business for yourself and then ultimately property so um i actually got involved in property before business right okay. so i got left a little bit of money bought a little it was really just a little commercial unit it was an old hairdresser's and we paid twenty nine thousand pounds for it rented it out easy done and that for me kind of like ticked the box in my head. I was getting the rent every month. It was covering my own rent on my own flat at the time. And it was just easy money. And for me, I was like, I was hooked. I was like, that's brilliant. And what age is this around? I was 21. Do you know what's great about that when you're young, right? Because yeah. I get starting property young as well at mm -hmm. the, the age of, of 19. So, you know, by the way, like it, it took me a good few years before I could figure anything out. So, but how good is it? And it was for me as well, when you start to add properties to your portfolio, or just yeah. like that there, and you want to get out there and flee the nest and get mm -hmm. into your own home. And one property or two properties could be mm -hmm. really making a big impact on that extra income. Yeah, 100%. Once I got sort of the second, third, I was like, well, this is actually covering most of my expenses. I was like, I can live relatively free per se, as long as like the rent keeps coming in. And even more than that, to be honest, it was more the mindset thing for me. When I bought that first property, it kind of took away that fear of like, in my mind, I was like, oh, how am I going to afford this? Or how am I going to manage that? Or... Like once I actually bought that first one, it took away sort of the the fear around buying properties and then the second and third and fourth and it just got easier and easier the more it went. Good. So uh, so you got your first property before getting into business. So yeah. tell me a bit more about the background, I guess, yourself and then how you get into business. So I've always kind of been quite like headstrong. I don't like authority really or anyone telling me what to do. I always had quite issues at school. Dropped out of college a couple of times as well. Just I've got a really short attention span, and if I'm not kind of hooked and interested, I just I'll just leave straight away. I'm not interested. So was bouncing in and out. Had a couple of different jobs. Always quite good at saving. Like that was always kind of my main thing. Even though I was always in and out of different like well, I always had a job, but in and out of different industries. But I always made a point of saving as much as I could, saving as much as I could. The first property kind of set it in my head. Like I was saying, that kind of flicked the switch in my brain, going, No, I can actually do these things. I want to do. So going from there, I got a job at an offshore company, which I'd been trying to get for a little while. I wanted a little bit more money. I eventually got paid off from them in 2016, I think it was, or 17. I need to double check. And once I got paid off, I went back to work with my dad, who has a landscaping business. And at this point, there's no real... This is my first venture into business, obviously. There was no plant hire companies between Dundee and Aberdeen, and that's where we're located so when I'm working with my dad and meeting all the different trades and meeting these developers and all these different people, they were always saying, always saying, oh, we can't find machines, we don't have diggers, we don't have this, we don't have that. And I was immediately thinking, well, what's the difference between buying a flat and renting it out or buying a digger and renting it out? In my mind, it was pretty much the same thing. So we went and bought this old, rattly piece of shit digger. It was like 20 years old with an old scabby trailer for six grand. And within the first year, I'd got my six grand back from it whilst I was working with my dad. And I was like, do you know what? That's brilliant. I was like, I'm dropping it off before work. I'm going to work. I'm coming home. I'm getting the rent from that. I'm getting my rent from my flats. I'm getting my wages from working. And I managed to just save at a rapid rate. And when COVID hit, I went and bought, but well, I sunk the rest of my savings into a few more machines, got the business going a little bit more. And it kind of blew up, to be honest, over COVID. It was perfect timing. So during COVID, obviously, a lot of construction has still been able to, yeah. to happen, right? So I guess that that's kept the business going because yeah. hiring plant and so forth. Mm -hmm. So take us through the journey of that because was it around that period of time that you get exposed to PMW and things? Just before, yeah. So pre-COVID, I would obviously, I was doing the diggers, well, the digger singular for a year or so. Just as COVID kind of hit in 2019, I'd just bought on a second digger. 
as the first lockdown kicked in. So I got a really good price on it. Lockdown kicked in, the price of machinery shot through the roof. But not only that, like you say, a lot of building was still happening and everyone was stuck at home. And everyone wanted their gardens done, everyone wanted their, their man caves or their sheds or whatever built. So we noticed the hires just like exploded, it went through the roof. So within that sort of one year period, we went from two machines to 10 machines, like quite rapidly. We had a, a depot, I had two guys on staff, we had multiple vehicles on the road doing deliveries, stuff like that. And COVID was really actually a big factor for it. I hate saying it because a lot of people lost their jobs and it was yeah. obviously this awful thing. But for me personally, it, it grew the business quite perfectly time-wise. And then come the end of COVID at 20, it was about March, 2021. That's obviously when I did the, the first online training with your cell and then we've been going since there. So what got you to uh, think about property and then ultimately come along? Was that a jump start you came to first? It wasn't actually. It was one of the online training courses you did because obviously it was COVID. We couldn't have yeah, a person okay. meet. So it was one of the, it was three nights online. I think it was a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Right, that makes sense. So you came along. Well, first of all, so I'd love to know what, uh, I guess it may have been sparked by the fact that you had had properties. Well, I already had, at that point, I had three. So I'd already had, or was it two? Two or three. I bought another shop with my dad, which was like an old derelict shop. It'd been empty for 17 years. We spent two years over COVID renovating it, tidying it all back up, refinanced it before I even knew what refinancing was. Well, got it to the value and then refinanced once I'd met you. And we managed to pull all the money back out. So I was like, holy shit, like, I thought all that money was gone. In my mind, I'd, I'd spent it, it was done. We just had this flat. When we got that money back, I was like, shit, this is really starting to propel the property journey now as well, as long as the, alongside the plant hire. Okay, so good. So then I guess you came along. Did you attend Protege in person or was that also yeah. online? So no, you did no, it? no, it was in person in May of 2021. 2021, so you're, you're less than three years into your journey, two I guess? Two and a half, two and a half. I mean, that's amazing, especially when we dig into the stuff that you've been working on and what you've been doing. Been right. you know? I think about it sometimes as well. Like, I don't know, it just, it feels like such a short time, but then when, like, when I go into my old office from the plant hire, I look at the office and I'm like, it feels like a lifetime ago. But it was only two years. Like, it's it's crazy to think. Yeah, uh, I love it. I can't wait to dig into that. So when, before you came to Protege, what was your expectations? Because I guess most people's expectations change once they get the information and the knowledge and they get all the strategies and, yeah. you know, but what was your expectations? Was it to add a few more properties to your portfolio or what, what was it before you actually came and went through it? To be honest, yeah, it was to keep growing the portfolio. That's always been the main aim for me is to get the income up. The The monthly income has always been my biggest thing since I bought the first one, to be honest. When I seen that rent coming in, I'm like, if I can times this by 10 and then again, you'll have mass income coming in with relatively low input. It's not passive. I hate that word passive because nothing's passive. But for work to payment ratio, it's very low. So building the portfolio was always the biggest thing. But then as sort of times progressed and met yourself, learned a little bit more, seen the different strategies. Then we're looking at a lot of flips just now as well and a few other different sort of strategies just to kind of increase the cash pot. So did your mindset, first of all, how was your experience in Protege, I guess? Oh, it was brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Like, I've never been, how do I put it? Like, I've never had so much information at one time. It just, like, it fried my head. And every time you went on to a new subject, I'm like, right, I can do this, this, and this, and that. I can apply that there. And then we'd go on to something else, and I'm like, holy shit. Like, <laughs> I'm, like every time, and I'm like, oh, my God. It was kind of, I wouldn't say information overload, but... I know what I'm like, so I had to be quite specific in what I wanted because if not, I would try and do everything and achieve nothing. I'm terrible for that. Yeah. So I just tried to kind of focus in on the, the finance side of it, raising finance and also the finances and mortgages and lending and then just building the portfolio. That was my main concern in the beginning. And you do like a number of joint ventures, don't you, with people oh, in yeah. the tribe in yeah. terms of getting access to investment and things mm -hmm. too. So I know a number of people that, that's invested with you, mm -hmm. which is great because you're now delivering, giving them a return at the same time, growing your own property business. That's probably, for me anyway, in the beginning, like I've always been quite comfortable with money. I've always been comfortable with my own. I've always been comfortable saving. And I remember the first thing we said, oh, you can leverage private finance to do your deals. And I was like, who the fuck's going to give me money? I was like, why would they give me money? And to be honest, I didn't even want to take the money. I think it was maybe a confidence thing or I think it was maybe just a, I didn't feel like I was that guy. But then the first one we did and I realised, right, I've took that money on, I've bought the property. I've kept the property in the end. The investors got a, a great return and it was a six month deal. I paid them back in three months. So he got it twice as quick as he expected. Everyone won. And that for me just kind of ticked the box in my head. I'm like, that's a no brainer. Why wouldn't he do that? And why wouldn't I take it? And once I kind of realized that in my own head and got myself out of the way, 
we've over the last year we've raised over half a million pounds just out of the group it's been brilliant and this is what I love because see people who are maybe listening to this and and watching they're they're, they're probably like, what someone's just going to give you money for you to go and buy a property <laughs> that you're going to keep and you're just going to give them the money back in a return mm -hmm. well how does that even work but that's the thing it's this misconception that you know that people have around people who have got money and if they're going to mm -hmm. invest and you know if they're going to take the the big chunks and take half the property or what it's all in the structure and i think that's one of the main things that we teach at protege isn't it because you know once you come to protege you learn how to find the deals learn how to structure the deals all the different strategies build the network then you have a skill set don't you and that mm -hmm. skill set and that's where i guess your confidence came off the back yeah. of getting the right deals and going well that that's why the investors going to put their money in because they're going to get a return that they wouldn't get anywhere else it's mm -hmm. going to be far greater but at the same time you've got confidence in the deal that you're doing yourself and when you have that confidence then everybody as you say is going to win mm -hmm. the thing for me as well is i think it kind of helped that i'd done deals anyway i'd done a couple of deals before i came and as soon as i'd done protege I'd, I'd done a few more i added more to my portfolio i think i bought another three flats in about four months after doing the training and i'd done a couple of other smaller things and at the same time the business was kind of doing quite well at this point so from me from maybe two years previous to where I was there even I'd learned a lot and I'd gained a lot and I could leverage the business I had a really good network because I knew all the trades I knew a lot of the councils I knew like most of the people from that side of the business anyway so I could take that network over and then I could take the new information I had and it kind of just it worked perfectly for me it really did yeah no it's been great to see because you have applied uh, a lot of the strategies and one of the strategies that I, I see often is deal sourcing, mm -hmm. you know, finding properties that you don't want to add to your own portfolio. It's a great strategy for cash flow. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you're, you're able to put those out and get people, investors who, who are wanting to, to buy those deals from you. So you're starting mm -hmm. to build that reputation in and around your area for, for getting deals for people too. Yeah. It's, it's one of the things like, I remember again on the course when you said deal sourcing, I'm like, that doesn't work. I was like, there's no way. I was like, that's nobody's, it just didn't compute in my brain. And then again, the first couple I did, I was like, well, yeah, it makes sense because it's taken me say, some, some deals can take three weeks, four weeks to find. And then you're nudging them along the line, you're negotiating. And there's a lot of work that goes into actually finding a deal. So when you realize the people that are buying the deals don't have time, then it's a no brainer. Of course, they're willing, they're willing to trade a little bit of money because they're going to save four weeks worth of time or loads of hassle or having to negotiate or having to find or doing five viewings or whatever it is so the first few I did of that I was like shit actually this is a really good thing and that that's just basically been the gravy for us now that kind of covers all our bills our fuel the marketing expenses the the general business expenses are covered with that which means any money we actually make through our developments we can just sink back into more developments and it's just growing quite quick so it's been good yeah no I love that and again I guess it's your whole uh, background and your understanding of money being able to manage money which is in an odd way um, a po well, it's a massive positive, but it's not normally what we get taught when we're young, is it? So w what was oh. that around your mind? Because that's that served you well, because what you've just said there, because many people that I know, like this is this is the, the funny thing, right? You can make a lot of money in property. And I know many people who do deal trades make a lot of money in trades, but then go and start blowing their brains out straight away, <laughs> going buying flash cars, yeah. going on the holidays. And hey, look, do what you want with your money, right? But you had a different mindset of that. And that's slightly like delayed gratification. It's thinking, well, I want to build the business, reinvest. Mm -hmm. you know, what, what age are you, Taylor? 29. 29. 29. So, so still incredibly young in your mm -hmm. journey, you know? So you've got a very different mindset from most people who go out there and just squander money, I guess. It wasn't always like that. Like the only reason, and I say this to my, like my sisters all the time and my mum and my dad is like, the only reason I'm decent with money now is because I was awful with money. For, like I've always right, been okay. quite obsessed with money, but I went through a phase from maybe, I don't know, maybe as soon as I was like 18 and I could go out to the pub until I was probably about 21. And I always say this as a joke, but like 21 was kind of the age I pulled my head out my arse. Like I went through a little phase and it was just coincided with getting left that money for the, the first property. And I wanted to buy the car. I wanted to go and buy like a Rolex watch. I wanted to go on like a, a month long holiday and blow all the money. And I thought, you know what? What am I going to have at the end of that? I'm going to have fuck all. I'll just have a car that's probably going to cost me a fortune in petrol or I'll probably crash because I knew what I was like at that age. <laughs> I'll have a watch that'll either get lost or scratched or damaged or whatever else. And I thought, you know what? It's just, there's no longevity to that for me. Like nice stuff's cool. Like I do, I don't mind nice stuff, but I'd rather have a bit more freedom than anything else. And for me, I've always been able to buy freedom with income. Yeah. So I'd rather keep the money and put it to use. I can buy fancy stuff whenever I want, but something I noticed as well is like I even when I bought a new car last this year, sorry, 
and everyone was commenting, oh, you must be doing really well, oh, you must be getting on, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, really, to me, I was doing better before I bought the car. I had more money. But then I go and buy the car, I've depleted my funds, but everyone's like, oh, you're doing so well. And I'm like, this makes no fucking sense to me. How does that, it doesn't compute, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I've never been a big stuff person. Like, it doesn't really bother me. Yeah, no, I'm right there with you as well. I'm the same. I mean, it's always nice to have the material things, mm -hmm. the cars and all the toys and everything else. But if you can delay that mm -hmm. on the pursuit of building wealth, because again, you want your assets to be able to pay for everything and more, your 100%. life too, yeah. you know? So it's amazing what you've been building. So, you know, implementing the, the, the deal sourcing and deal trading strategy for cash flow, and, you know, and, um, you know, and I guess doing lots of joint ventures, which I see, I, I see your name coming up all the time in the group. Mm -hmm. I'm doing a JV with Taylor, we're, we're working together on this as well. So, you know, I love that, but maybe let's start talking into some of the deals you were doing after Protege, because of course, you were building your portfolio mm -hmm. and then you started transitioning to, to flips and so forth. So mm -hmm. maybe talk me through some, some of the deals. So the biggest one I've done today until the ones we're starting just recently, we did a four bedroom house and it'd been derelict for about seven or eight years. It had damp problems all throughout. We had to, we took it completely back to the brick, down with the floors, dug the floors out, new concrete floors, framed the whole lot. And that for me, would I like the flip because it's going to take you six months either way to buy a property and renovate it. If you rent it out, you kind of leave your equity tied up and then you get the income, which is great. But for the flips, within the six months we'd been paid. And off of that one, I think we generated about £40,000 profit in the space of six months. I think it was six months and three days until we got paid exactly. And I was just like, holy shit, that was quick. And that's quite a chunk of money. And in my mind, I was like, well, if we can do three of them a year or four of them a year, which is relatively not easy to do, but simple to do, that for me, I'm like, we can then take that same hundred grand and buy multiple properties every year and grow at an exponential rate compared to what we were before. Yeah. And then I guess from that, there's a number of projects you're working on in terms of uh, potential land developments, mm -hmm. potential essays as well, and, mm -hmm. and various conversions. So yeah. maybe talk us through some of those ones and um, maybe any of the juicy deals you're working on just now. Yeah. So we, um, we just picked up keys to, again, another four bedroom house. This time, this one was used as a cannabis farm, so okay. it was an absolute mess. Like you can imagine, it was every single room. There's holes through every wall. There was like still the big filters and all the ducting and stuff. All the pots everywhere. There's leaves on the floor. It was absolutely humming. It was stinking. But that for me, they're always the ones I like because you walk in and nine out of ten people will walk in, walk straight back out, and I'm like, perfect, that's fine. All the competition's gone. We can come in and negotiate now. So I always like the problem properties. That one's going to be good. We got that for one hundred fifteen thousand. And the end market value is looking at roughly 230, but likely 250 with the finish we'll do. Okay. And there's, again, there's probably about 50, 60,000 profit in that. Not f entirely for myself, again, we're joint venture with a lot of different guys. So that gets split between a few folk, but a good profit margin anyway. Yeah. So um, if that sells at um, early 200s, it's still a good 30, 40K. If it goes exactly. up to 250, then you're. You're laughing. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. And then uh, with some of the land deals, I know that you're still currently working on one just now. So I mm -hmm. guess the information, you know, we'll, we'll keep it as vague. But <laughs> what got you looking at developments, you know? Really just, again, just trying to scale up quicker. Like it's after, it's been a couple of years now. So I'll, I get bored quite easily. And I thought, you know what, doing one property at a time is fine. But I'm bored of that now. So I want to try and build a bigger, either a bigger property or new build developments, a block of flats, anything in particular. And it's slightly a longer term plan, but it's more gains at the end. So I'm happy to put in a bit more work to get the bigger profit at the end. Yeah, it's one of the things I always say to anybody in their journey. And I guess that's fortunate for yourself. And, you know, you've been in property, well, a lot longer than the two and a half years since promoted you, right? But yeah. it's amazing what you've achieved in the last two and a half years. Yeah. It's because you've scaled things up. You've, mm -hmm. you've rapidly started to grow and build a property business where it's now your full time gig. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what you're building on a daily basis, which... Um, just for people to try and get them to comprehend. It took me five years. It took me five years before I replaced my income and went full-time in property because I wanted to build a property business. So very mm -hmm. similar, except you did it in less than half the time. But the good thing about that is, is that because you've got the business and it's running, I know you've got support there with your mm -hmm. partner and things, is that, you know, you're doing the trades, you're doing the flips, you're building a portfolio and you're starting to systemize that business so you can oversee things mm -hmm. and you've got a great team around you, but more importantly, it now allows you to start looking at those bigger projects. Yeah, it just kind of frees up a bit of time. Like you say, once when when I took Shannon in the business, that was 
it kind of it was a silver lining like she you know yourself but she she broke her shoulder doing jujitsu she was off she had to get surgery it was wasn't a great situation but on the back end of it she's been at home for almost a year now we spend a lot more time together she helps me in the business she gave up her own business because of that which again wasn't great but the silver lining is we spend more time together we're happier we have we just get on a lot better now and with her coming into the business she's taking a lot of the the rigmarole and the admin and the stuff that i i'm useless at to be honest and computer stuff i'm just awful she'll do a lot of that which will allow me to actually focus on getting new clients getting new investors getting new deals doing the stuff that actually generates the money yeah and it's working really well it's, it's really working quite well yeah it's uh it's one of those dynamics <coughs> when you've got a, a partner for mm -hmm. some people it's their idea of a nightmare but for for you and i because i know of the yeah. self for me it's like alexa and i are, were heavily involved together yeah in business i couldn't imagine it any other way you know there's those challenging moments disagreements and Definitely. everything else but at the same time we're, we're both trying to build the same future the same mm -hmm. idea and concepts behind it and i guess that's the same with you guys because anytime i see you both together you know you use you, you are so happy about what you're working on and getting to spend more time with each other and do the things that you love with the jiu-jitsu as mm -hmm. well as building a business it's great to see 100 percent. something i was always quite picky when i was younger especially with girls because I see, i've seen so many people completely choose the wrong person and ruin their life and I was always really, really picky and really quite, and I said this to Shan, like, she hated it, but I put her through loads of tests when we were first going out together, and she's like, oh, you're an arsehole. And I was like, well, to be fair, look how long we've been together now. And she ticked all the boxes, and she's still ticking boxes now, for me anyway, and I know it sounds awful, but I've seen people get with the wrong person, and it and it completely saps their motivation, saps their drive, and they're just, they're just not the same person anymore. They don't have the same dreams. They can't keep going. And I definitely think if you have the right partner, then you can really do anything you want. Absolutely. I agree with that a thousand percent. Mm -hmm. So um, talk us through some of the, um, well, some of the other projects you're maybe working on just now, which you think would be good to, to share, maybe some of the challenges you're facing, because I think it's always good to, to bring those up as well, because, mm -hmm. you know, the one thing is with challenges and people who are entrepreneurial, especially someone like yourself, it's not to be put off by the challenges or the problems, mm -hmm. because it's property after all. There's mm -hmm. always going to be things, mm -hmm. but it's how you overcome those. So maybe have a little chat around um, yeah. those well this is it like, like you say problems in my mind i've started to equate problems equal profit this is what i tell myself all the time if you can solve as many problems as possible efficiently then that's how you're going to make your money so one we're working on that's probably been the biggest issue i've had for a while was just a little one bedroom flat we bought it in march 2022 so we're going on a year and a half now and on monday coming so three days from now we've got an eviction being served on the tenant which has just been an absolute nightmare with the current, like the, the Tenant Protection Act and the cost of living and all this stuff. We bought it with the tenant in situ, knowing that we would evict him and he was happy to, to go to a new home because him and the previous landlord had some issues. So we bought the property, took him on, we're just a way to get him out of the property and that's when they brought in all this new legislation. So he's been essentially stuck there for the last year. And don't get me wrong, he's not the most desirable tenant. He's got his own issues, but he's, he's generally okay. He wanted to leave. I wanted him to leave. We've had the eviction served and granted six months ago in March, but we weren't allowed to serve it now. So we've had to wait another six months. And it seems to to be like, really the only people that are causing the barriers here are the council and the government. Like I phoned the council and went back and forward with them. They're like, oh yeah, there is, there is spare properties. There's properties here and there and we could put them there. And I was like, cool, so why don't we just move them down so we can speed this process up? And they're going, oh, we can't do that until the day he's homeless. So I essentially have to make this guy homeless on Monday for them to give him a property that's been sitting empty for four months. I'm like, how? this is just so counterproductive. How does this make sense? But this is only one experience. This is going to be happening to thousands of people. And it's the government's fault, to be fair. It's the government's lack of foresight and lack of interest in the industry. They're just kind of throwing these random rules out and going, oh, this will work. And it has the complete opposite effect. And then it's the landlords that always get the brunt of it. It's not the government. It's not the, the policymakers. It's always oh, the nasty landlords have made them homeless. And you're like, you have no idea what's going on here. Yeah, it's one of those ones that uh, I hate when a topic comes up because I've got strong opinions ah, around crazy. it as well, you know. And, and uh, unfortunately, I think that the Scottish government especially uh, are, are our biggest problem when it comes to developers, when it comes to us landlords, mm -hmm. you know. And, 
you know, of course, landlords get a bad rep. They, they get a bad rep. And, and and I guess that's fueled by the TV programme Slum Landlords, you know, oh. where you've got you've got <laughs> those HMO houses where you've got way too many people living in there mm -hmm. and the places that are a wreck. But of course, what we teach at Protege and what you do yourself as well, because I've seen the finish that you mm -hmm. do in your properties, you know, we, we, we hold ourselves to high standard. 100%. You know, we want to, you know, renovate. And that's the thing, it's the crazy thing. It's not like we're taking people's homes. You know, we're buying the properties that nobody wants. Yeah. you know nobody wants them so it's not like we're causing a shortage the, the, the Scottish government with their planning policies is making it so tedious and mm -hmm. so difficult that no wonder there's a massive housing shortage that we're never going to get on top of mm -hmm. which is only going to continue to fuel this and if policies don't change especially around this shitty attitude about mm -hmm. you know um, the tenant eviction bans and you know the uh, that whole you need to evict someone make them homeless like yeah. what, how fucking crazy is that yeah. how can someone sit down and take a logical process and go yeah i put someone in the street and then we'll find a house for them this is what i says to them on the phone i was like are you genuinely being serious and they're like yeah well we can we can only do it on the day and i was like so i have to physically put them on the street before you go oh there's you can have one of these empty houses i was like think about what you've just said to me there it's absolutely ridiculous yeah it's um bizarre mm -hmm. and unfortunately i don't think it's going to change anytime soon no, it, to be honest, I think it's just going to... I don't know if it'll get worse, but they've just extended it again till March now, the, the Protection Act and whatever else, and it was only initially meant to be here for one year with the provision to be extended to two, so that's them used the two years now. So I'd be curious to see what they do in March. Yeah, I, and just to touch on that, because I think there's a... Um, again, a lot of people are kind of confused by this as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, if the tenant is wrecking the place or not paying the rent you can still evict them it's not like you can't evict a bad tenant you're in a situation yeah. where it's it's not a bad tenant per se it's just that you kind of need to make him evicted as such because he's going to have to move on and mm -hmm. he can't move on because he's not got another place so it's a kind of awkward yeah. predicament i suppose to be fair he is a bit of a pain in the ass i was just <laughs> trying to be polite so like i actually found another one bedroom flat one we sourced on for a client and uh, it was actually a client from singapore we sourced on a little one bedroom flat for them they were looking for a tenant and I was like, well, we can pop you in there and the DSS will pay the rent directly. And it was actually more than what they were expecting. So it was great for the, the client that bought the flat and it would have been fine for him. And I would also got my property back. But because he's that much of a spacer, he couldn't even go along for the viewing. And then the property ended up going to someone else. And I was like, mate, I'm trying to fucking help you here. I was like, I've, I had you another property. And he's like, oh, but I couldn't get to the appointment. And he's just like, I was just like, mate, come on now. Like, yeah, he's just one of those. But it is what it is. We're three days left now. Yeah. Okay. So good. So silver lining at the end <laughs> of it, but challenges, right? So yeah. yeah but, but I love that that shift in the mind frame and sense is mm -hmm. that is problems equal profit. Hundred percent. Love that. Hundred percent. I've I've always had that sort of mindset, but when you see it in action regularly, all the best deals I get have the biggest problems. Oh, we've got a roof leak. Oh, there's a hole here. Oh, there's a problem tenant that we can't get out for a year. There's a cannabis farm. There's all these different things, and you're like, cool. Tell me more about the problems because that's when I'm going to make my money. Yeah, nobody's really interested in. Oh, we've got a great house in perfect condition and there's no real issues. We want top like top dollar for it, and you're like, yeah, there's not really a great deal I can do with that. Yeah, and anything else that you want to share? Some of the projects you're working on, you think would be good to talk about, or other things that um, you maybe people who are just getting started in their journey, you know, just some uh, tale of wisdom, I guess. <laughs> Always do your due diligence, like. <laughs> The, another project then I'll share is uh, it was a, well it still is technically a commercial unit it used to be a three story co-op and there's a, a shop on the bottom and they've converted the two upper floors into two three bedroom flats so they were on the market for 190,000 I managed to negotiate them down there was about 110,000 for the pair when I was doing my due diligence and I was going through all the council documents and the council records it turns out they hadn't actually been passed by building control and what was done development wise didn't match the drawings that were submitted so we've went back with the architect the engineer the builder reviewed everything checked everything and we've came to the conclusion and obviously have discussed it with the council it's still essentially a commercial unit they're not residential there's a lot of remedial works that need to be done to make it that way we're going to have to go in and lift all the floors take the kitchens and bathrooms out we'll have to put a, a layer of fireproofing and soundproofing on each level for protection and then refit the whole flats so if I didn't do my due diligence, I could have way overpaid for that and I would have been deeply out of pocket just now. That then ties into sort of the things we get taught in Protégé as well as like, do your checks. Don't just take people at face value. Don't take surveyors at face value. Don't take agents at face value. Make sure you do your checks. 
because a small mistake in property can cost you 30, 40, 50, 100 grand if you're not doing these proper checks. Yeah, so many people get deal envy. They just see a deal like that and Aye. they go, oh, it's already been renovated. They just need to convert it, exchange, you know, yeah. change it from, from commercial to residential. It's already mm -hmm. half built and and without doing our due diligence, mm -hmm. just jumping right into something mm -hmm. like that, overpaying, because agents don't care. No. You know, anyone who's selling a deal don't care. They're going to dress it up in the mm -hmm. best possible way to freaking sell the thing. So you need to realise that, yeah, I need to do the right due diligence. Mm. And that's why I can't stress that enough. And we spend so much time at Protege mm -hmm. so that you're clear on what you, you know, what the kind of due diligence steps that you should be doing to make sure you don't get caught out. So it's Definitely. clever that you've done that. Is that a project you're moving ahead with now? Yeah, so we've just submitted the extension and the amendment to the building warrant. Because the building warrant was initially lodged in 2007, we're going to have to extend it twice and then resubmit it to what it is today. Okay. We'll then get the exact specifications. We know 99% what we need to do, but we're going to get the exact specifications and then I'm going to complete the sale because I've made the sale conditional on having this information. So, okay. I, so I don't get stung basically. Yeah. So we'll have that back in three, four weeks, I would say now. It's getting submitted this week. Once we've got that, we'll know exactly what needs done and then we can proceed with the purchase and then the renovation. Okay. So tentatively, just high levels just now because I know you're still drilling into mm -hmm. that and you're protecting yourself because it's subject to, yeah, you know, so, so from that point of view, it's good. But what are you, um, what's the exit on this and anticipated profits? So again, it, I always like to have a couple of exits in mind because you can never guarantee what the market's going to be like or what the, the situation's going to be like at the end. This in particular, this works as a buy to let as a serviced accommodation or as a flip. So option number one would be to flip it for the instant cash. Again, we've been discussing, there's a good, good contractor market in Montrose. So we're thinking probably because there are two, three bedrooms on top with a private entrance, it would be good to keep for SA. So we're gonna look at the figures. And again, it kind of hinges on the, the refurbishment, depending on how much we spend on the refurbishment. If it costs a little bit more than we expect, we'll probably keep it, recoup that money through serviced accommodation. If it comes in exactly where we think, we'll probably just flip it and take the instant cash. Okay, good. So you've got a couple of exits. Well, 100%. more than two, so you've yeah. got a few. But but SA is phenomenal. You just mentioned the contractor market as well, and a lot of people um, miss that opportunity to see yeah. where they can really maximise the income on their, their, their properties, which is always yeah. good as well. It's, uh, it's something that we're really interested in. Uh, the house I mentioned before, the one, the four-bedroom that we flipped, I kind of got a funny story. I was a bit sickened. So we sold that property, and we'd done the deal, agreed. We hadn't quite transferred funds, so it hasn't it wasn't hundred percent done. And I got a contract through from the service accommodation management company that I've been using. And there was a 13 month contract for four guys at 120 pounds a night. And I was like, Oh, don't worry about it. Thank you for bringing the contract. It's great, but we'll have to refuse it because we've got it going through in like I think it was about a week's time. And the guy was fine and I was all fine. And the next day I was like, Do you know what? I'm gonna run these numbers just to see what that contract was. And I really wish I never, because I did the numbers and 13 months at 120 turned out to be 47 and a half thousand pounds in rent that I would have received up front. And I was looking at it going, you fucking idiot. What have you done? I was like, you've just turned down a 50 grand contract and you could have kept the property. But it, it was a bit of a sickener. Like we'd already done the deal, but at the same time, it's good to know that that demand and those types of contracts are quite regularly available. Yeah. So you don't have scarcity which is the issue for so many people like, oh no, I'm not going to get another deal. You realise, look, I've done a deal with someone, I'm going to stick to my, my word yeah. and let the property sale go through, but still make profit. Yeah. I don't have a scarcity mindset because there'll be more. And again, this is what I love about your mindset, Taylor, because you just reshifted that going, well, mm -hmm. it's proof of concept. Yeah. You know? You can't, like, I, I don't get everything right and I, I make mistakes all the time, but if you can take the lesson from it, then it's not really a loss, is it? It's not really, like, I didn't lose. I still made really good money. I yeah. could have just made a little bit more. So it just means next time we do that, I'll make the little bit more. It's not the end of the world. Yeah, good stuff. Now, I can't have a fellow jiu-jitsu practitioner on my podcast and not talk about jiu-jitsu. <laughs> so we have um, <coughs> we have competed uh, not together because you're a, a, a different weight class. I, would, I, would I don't think I fancy that, that, that role, but um, we'll definitely get a role together mm -hmm. at some point for sure, you know. Sure. Uh, so we've competed at the the same um, competitions, yeah. you know, um, which is up beside where your gym. It's your your, yeah, your yeah, guys that run it. Yeah, my coach's competition. Yeah, yeah. Now I enjoyed that last time. Um, uh, you know, double gold as well at, at white know. belt, which was exciting up there. Um, so so jiu jitsu. What does that? Um, how does that help you with with your? Because I know I know it does for me a lot. Mm -hmm. But but just your thoughts on it in terms of business and life. The best thing I find about it is it it helps me switch off. I really struggle to switch off and. 
when it hits five o'clock, I'll grab my dog, take my dog for a quick walk, and then straight to class for six o'clock. I've just gotten in that routine now, and as soon as we hit the mats, it, it, you could have the worst day in the world. You could, oh, this roof's rotting, or oh, this problems are out. Like, you always get shit that you get through the day, and it's playing on your mind, but as soon as you hit the mats, my mind just goes completely blank, and I'm like, I'm focused on the task at hand. And I think if it wasn't for that, I would probably get quite caught up in, in the day-to-day -day problems and the day-to-day -day stuff. It really, it's like a, an active meditation. That's yeah. the only way I can think about it. It's like, I can't sit and just meditate because I'm dead fidgety, I'm like a child. But when I'm doing that, it clears my brain, but gives me something to focus on at the same time. Yeah, no, I agree. It's great, isn't it? Because you've got nothing else to focus on other than to stop this guy from choking you. Exactly. <laughs> You're like, shit, I'm going to die. I need to stop this. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's good. So so maybe i just share some of the um, the future stuff you're going to be like. What's the vision for Taylor going forward? And, and more importantly, how can people reach out and connect with you? To be honest, I was sitting thinking this more recently as well. I was I was doing a bit of reflecting and um, kind of looking, like you say, where we were a couple of years ago, what we've been doing, where we're at now. And I was looking at it, it was literally about a month ago and I woke up one morning and I was like, I'm literally living the dreams that I always had. Like when I look back five years ago, or even that kid at 21 that bought that that house, I had this dream in my head that I wanted. And I woke up the other day and I was like, fuck, I've, I've got everything I want. Like I've literally gotten everything I wanted. So I'm kind of having to reframe a little bit now. I'm like, shit, what do I want now? Like, what's the next thing? I'm not even too sure. Like I've always wanted to buy a house in Spain or abroad somewhere. So I think that's probably on the cards in the next couple of years. Other than that, business-wise, I'm happy with the business. It's going good. It's going the way I want it. So as long as I keep working at it, it'll grow. Personally, I would like to, well, me and my girlfriend, Sham, we're, we're starting to look at having some kids. We're, uh, we obviously live together. We've got a dog. We're just looking to just kind of start a family now going forward, to be honest. That's about the main thing. Exciting. So the next chapter is just about to unfold, I guess. Uh, well, I hope so, yeah. I hope so. That's the plan. Good stuff. And how can people connect with you? So Instagram is Taylor McDonald Property. Facebook is just Taylor McDonald. LinkedIn, Taylor McDonald again. Or you can catch my website, which is firstseedproperty.com. Good stuff. Brilliant. Taylor, it's been an absolute pleasure having a conversation with you. Perfect. Thank you very much for having me. Oh, brilliant. So good stuff. Well, there you go. I hope you guys are inspired because when you start to hear about people's journey and what they've been up to and what they're doing, you know, it's just exciting to hear. At least it is for me and for many people who reach out and are inspired by these podcasts. And as always, I'm going to link off to the show notes to Taylor's socials and his website and stuff so you can go and check him out and connect with him. And if you get any questions at all, pop it in the comments below. I'll be sure to go in there to respond and I'm sure Taylor will keep an eye out there as well to jump into. So thanks for listening or watching in. Um, all the best and bye for now. Thank you.